Hi, this is Lex, and welcome to the Fintech Blueprint. It's your podcast about fintech, decentralized finance, digital banking, investing, robo-advice, artificial intelligence, and all the other frontier technology that is transforming financial services. To get more content, like an illustrated transcript of this conversation in your inbox, subscribe at fintechblueprint.com. So without further delay, let's jump into today's episode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's conversation. I'm really excited to have with us today Lu Zeng, who is the founder and managing partner at Fusion Fund, a venture fund that invests across deep technology, including artificial intelligence, healthcare, as well as industrial technology. And we are going to explore the various investment themes across artificial intelligence and learn about how a venture fund works. Lu, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Very glad you're joining the discussion today. My pleasure. You were an entrepreneur very early on and then had an exit. Can you tell us about what that felt like, what that experience was like building a company and then being able to to get it to the end of the road, to get it to the conclusion? As you mentioned, I was an entrepreneur before I started my own VC firm. I still joke joke about it with my founder friend that when you're a founder, your life is uh, kind of miserable. But on the other side, the whole founder journey is super rewarding in terms of the personal growth and also working on something really creative and be able to bring value to the industry. So my company was focused on healthcare. So it was a medical device company solving the problem for early diagnostic of type 2 diabetes. Market size was huge and my technology was very unique. And I really learned from the scratch to understand how to not only build a product, but also navigate within this very complicated healthcare system to build up partnership to deliver the solution and also have a sustainable business model, make good revenue. So definitely it's an amazing learning experience. And also all this operational skill set enabled me to become a better investor after I sold my company. When I realized, okay, what is really critical for founder to launch a product and also how to engage in with different parties, including venture capitalists, capital, and also talents and a large corporate as a partnership to make it work. I do want to highlight one thing. I launched my company more than 10 years ago. At that time, there was no such a hot buzzword about AI, but we started to utilize the value of the data we collected, try to push for more personalized diagnostic result. Later on, you know, people started calling it as AI in healthcare. So I think from that moment, we already start to realize, I already start to realize, you know, the true value is within the data, but how we find the effective tool to understand the data better and also be able to turn it into something really personalized, really powerful, and also low cost solution for every single user and patient. That's really later translate into our sector focus within healthcare. It's also AI in healthcare. And we, meanwhile, we'll be investing enterprise AI in general for both application and also AI infrastructure. So it's a great journey. So lots of things happen for a reason. I didn't realize when I was a founder and after I sold my company, started a VC firm, I'm like, oh, I see that really helped me. Another thing I also want to highlight is when I sold my company, my ownership was 72%. And I have many founder friends who was impressed by that, including investors saying that, oh, you control such a high ownership of the company. How did you do that? The reality was I had a harder time to raise capital. I was not entitled to easily raise a bunch of capital just to spend as much as I want. I raise limited capital and I have to really focus on generating revenue and early partnership to make sure the company survive and eventually become successful. When I start to do negotiation of the merger acquisition, I found this high ownership really gave me strong leverage power. So everything have two sides. That's one thing I always share with the founder. And another thing is, that's also a unique experience for me to realize, okay, venture capital is really just a catalyst to help founder to grow faster. The fundamental of the business is still how to build a useful product and generating good revenue. And the way you have such a great product, you don't want to raise so much money. You only need to raise bare minimum capital needed for, you know, 
extension of the cash flow runway, I'll maybe just help you in terms of the business expansion. And later, having this high ownership and control of the company is going to give founder lots of edge. That's also another thing we've been helping our founder doing right now. We invest in early stage, and then we really partner up with the founder, maintain their ownership and control over the company. There's a lot to unpack in there. Going back to your entrepreneurial journey, you know, you've touched on kind of the positive sides of the experience, but you also called it a can of misery, which of course is, I think, pretty accurate. What were some of the hardest parts? What was the things that went wrong or some of the plans that didn't quite happen? What were the hardest parts of your entrepreneurial journey? Probably it's not only me. If you ask most of the founder, typically when you're running a startup at early stage, nothing goes with the plan. <laughs> it's always, there's always a surprise. Surprise might be a nicer word to, to describe that. There's always a surprise happening. There are always things you have to quickly adapt into and also adjustment, doing adjustment, evolution of the product, evolution of the structure upgrade of the team, things are quickly evolving and changing every single day. So I would say how to quickly adapt to the new situation every day is important for me and also for every single founder. For me, it was a little bit more challenging because I was 21 years old when I started a company. I was a solo founder. And meanwhile, that was the second year I came to the United States. I was studying in Stanford and was starting a company. So Lots of learning to start with. I, I think that the first one year is definitely, I, I feel like, oh my God, I am overwhelming with all the things I needed to, to learn. And also just having such a strong drive, I'll maybe also pressure, I need to grow. I'm not growing fast enough. I need to grow much, much faster because things are just uh, hitting on me. And uh, every single day, there's a new thing I need to solve. There's no time to break. So that's the number one challenging thing. But I think that's true for most of the startup when the initial get started. I just have a slightly unique position because of the age and experience I, I had at the time. The second thing is really how to handle people saying no to you. I was too young when I was a founder. So initially, I didn't handle it too well. I initially took it personally. I'm like, why people are saying no to me? Why there are so many no's? Well, my technology is really good. If you remember more than 10 years ago, the the major focus area, maybe the popular sector in Silicon Valley was not healthcare, was not AI, was consumer, was business model innovation. That's not what I was building. So in order to find the investor who understand the tech and also be aligned, be able to align with my vision and also be supportive to my business was very tough. It was a tons of meeting. I was joking that one day out of five days in a week, if I could got a yes day, that would be great. Means I got a couple of yes in that day. For the rest of the day, I'm always getting no's. It takes a while for me to realize, okay, there's a reason people say no. I shouldn't take it personally. I also should always stay positive as an entrepreneur and really think about, look at, look at things differently. Like, okay, people say no for me. Like, why? And try to learn, try to grow, try to be better. And also, just take the challenge and uh, fight back. That's when I'm, I was joking with my friend, like, thanks to my culture. Um, I grew up from a place called Inner Mongolia. If you heard about the Mongolian culture, where warriors will fight a battle. So I was pretty persistent and also strong, resilient, be able to continue to learn and continue to grow and eventually make the company success. But the journey of learning and digest the no, digest the rejection, and be able to translate it into a power to encourage myself to grow, it takes some time and takes some effort. It was not easy. So one of the things about becoming a venture investor is that you become the person saying no. Can you talk about that transition from you know, trying to win people over and trying to sell and then starting your own investment firm. I guess you do You do end up fundraising for the investment firm. And so you do still have to do the entrepreneurial sort of bootstrapping. But in the core business of looking at companies, it kind of flips to you being the person that has to reject 99% of the pitches. Can you talk about that transition, about setting up the fund and then what you had to learn to make that work? 
I was lucky because I got very good financial return from my company exit, my previous startup company. So for almost a year, I was doing angel investing with my own personal check, small check, 20K, 200K, and invest across 13 companies. But out of 13 companies so far, I got four IPO. That's when I started to realize the power of early stage investment and also seriously consider to make it a official career path and make it institutionalized. So launched the fund one in 2015. You're right. It's not only my personal money. I also raised money from other LP. But because our fund one was relative smaller size, and also I already built up a personal track record in the previous year with my personal investment. And also I have such a unique sector focus back in the days while well, people start talking about consumer. I've been championing about AI, healthcare, deep tech in general. I was talking about fundamental tech innovation, tech application innovation is coming. Then, you know, the business model innovation of the internet stage is, uh, is almost done. So all this methodology attract LP who like my uh, thesis and really like who I am, how I do investment. So they came to support me. I did a little bit of fundraising, but not really official. Uh, have relatively efficient and very fast the start of the fun one. And as you said, now I'm the one saying no to founders. I still remember when I launched the Fusion Fund, I have many founder friends joke about saying that, oh, you went to the dark side. You sound like a shark now. I'm like, I'm not a shark. Come on. Like shark has very small brain. They're not that smart. And I could be dolphin, you know, still considered as a predator, but full of compassion, very smart and also working as a group. So come to work with me. I think one thing we did very well is from day one of a future fund, we start to build up different community. For the first community we built it up was a super founder network. Initially are all my friends who are serial entrepreneurs who exit previously through much acquisition. Most of them, some of them even did IPO in the past. Still driven, still passionate about doing something new. And also they're a top founder. Top founder knows top founder. They also refer good company to me. So based on that network and also extension of the network, I was able to quickly connect with the founder who fully align with our sector focus, working on something really awesome. And I could support them even before they start thinking about fundraising. So I think being able to create our own preparatory deal flow is important. So the matching success rate will be slightly higher. Instead of just talking to all the early stage founder as much as possible, which going to be the result, as you said, we need to say no to 99% of the founder. Why is that? I, I don't quite follow. So if you have a network of good founders, they'll recommend companies, you know, I guess versus just the average founder that writes to you. Like, can you talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, like, if we don't have our own community will just talk to all the founder on the market. You know, lots of time investors say no, it's because mismatching of their sector. For example, I got consumer founder reach out to me. I got lots of the uh, founder reach out to me within the sector is not in our focus area. So that's an easy no, but think about that's not the best use of founders time on our time. Versus we have this community that is already designed based on our sector focus. So the matching success rate will be much higher. We still do both. You know, we have founder, a super founder network as our preparatory sourcing channel. We're also talking to founders through other referral network. I think it's essential to keep doing both to increase the success rate of the matching. And another thing, as I mentioned, is really about how to say no to founder. I remember when I was a founder, I mentioned that I wanted to learn from the nose. I want to be better. So we also want to offer very structured feedback to the founder when we say no. Let them know what is the reason, what is our concern. And some of them, we may directly say no because of not, not the matching or maybe certain concern is a potential red flag for us. For other founders, we may keep monitor. We tell them it might be the timing issue, might want to see more validation. So that's the way we say no to the founder. But essentially, I think to be effective and efficient during the sourcing process is very important to create our own founder network and be able to have better matching when we're doing the sourcing. 
Well, let's shift to the investment thesis in particular around what today is artificial intelligence. How do you approach that? Do you have an opinionated point of view on the market around where those trends are going? Or is it more you look at the whole market and kind of try to network into the different themes? Like, what is your investment thesis on artificial intelligence? Yes, we actually have a very clear thesis around AI since 2017. You know, 2017, we published the report on AI in healthcare. Also, another one is related to AI infrastructure on edge computing data privacy. We've been really championing for the investment in the sector and also being monitored and observed the growth of the evolution of the industry. Number one thing, you know, this AI trend is real. People all see the power of the no matter Gen AI and other AI algorithm. We always believe the trend of AI is no code AI platform means the user of the AI tool doesn't need to learn a single line of code or write a single line of code. That's the beauty of the technology. You know, just open up the opportunity for everyone to benefit from the productivity improvement powered by AI. So this time is not only technology industry. AI could implement with all different industry across the sector, across the region. So I told, I keep telling to invest and founders since two years ago, I'm like, this time the AI trend powered innovation might be even 10x bigger than the internet. However, there's always a however, who gonna benefit? You know, the main theme of internet was a disruption, but I think the main theme of the AI trend is really in power. So all the players gonna got in power, not only just a smaller startup. So the reality is maybe roughly 60, 70% of the innovation opportunity going to dominate by the large company, especially a large technology company. If we're specifically looking at consumer application and the enterprise application, for consumer application, maybe more than 90% will be dominated by the large tech company. Not only they have GPU power, they have resources. Also think about in order to find to the solution, the quality of the data for now, it already matters more than the quantity of the data and who has the highest, highest quality of the consumer data in the market right now. It's not public data, it's all this large tech company. So they could use a uh, higher quality data with a very lower cost, a very efficient way to fine train, fine tuning their AI algorithm and AI product. So there's opportunity for consumer AI startup, but it's just uh, harder for startup company to quickly in competing with all this larger player, not to mention OpenAI and Swarpic backing by all this large tech company. So that's number one thing. And then looking at enterprise, we just feel like, okay, there's also unique opportunity here. I always mention about data when I mention about AI, right? So we need to look at which industry has a huge amount of high quality data could really showcase the capability of AI. So healthcare is number one. That's also the reason why since 2017, we've been promoting for AI in healthcare. And also we've been looking at other industry like health, uh, like insurance, financial, logistic, even space industry who are generating huge amount of high quality data, but they don't have bandwidth or don't have the talent of AI to utilize the value of the data. So that's the interesting opportunity for startup. And uh, another good news is Company like Pfizer, company like Nova Artists, all these large corporate who have valuable internal data, I don't think they will want to share their internal data with company like Microsoft or Google. So they would have a more preference to work with a smaller startup, be able to enable lots of the vertical AI application. So overall, our thesis around AI, number one, you know, for AI application, it's important to identify the the good or maybe the right industry and application for startup to working on because there's tons of application every industry should integrate with AI. Doesn't mean every industry gonna be able to dominate by the startup drive innovation. So based on what I mentioned, which industry have high quality, huge amount of data, which industry lack of productivity, which industry also won't share the data with large tech company, that will be the opportunity for the smaller startup. So that's application layer. Another layer is really important is AI infrastructure. I shouldn't call it one layer, it's an ecosystem. AI infrastructure, including from chip layer hardware to the software like a cloud info, to the security, to edge, eventually to the application data layer. So the whole ecosystem have so many different technology evolved and it's essential to have new 
innovation there to solve a fundamental problem right now. Our challenge of the implement of AI, which is the cost. AI is so expensive. First, the GPU consumption is way too high. Everyone knows about it already. Second thing people talk about it more and more is energy consumption. Very quickly, we're going to realize the limitation, the bottleneck of AI is not necessarily only chip and algorithm. It's actually the energy. We don't have enough electricity. And the third is really the latency. And we want to see much faster respond and reply when you implement an AI solution. We've been investing in edge computing since 2018. And now the future of AI is very clear, AI on the edge device. How to really have low latency and no latency on edge device when you're using AI is important. And the last is data privacy. It's huge. It's not only just the simple data privacy on the application layer. It's the whole security of the AI chip, the AI security, AI model and AI infrastructure. So that's what I call the opportunity of AI info, solve all these four major challenges we're facing right now and make AI not only better, faster, but also cheaper. Fascinating stuff. And I think, again, there's quite a couple of different topics to unpack. So starting with the application layer, which is you kind of, you drew the line between consumer and enterprise and suggested that consumer is a very expensive capital intensive war and the large big tech companies are are likely to park there and so that gives you enterprise and these different industry verticals and especially looking at places where enterprises are more likely to work with small companies rather than the microsofts and oracles and ibms and so the question i have for you there is actually are there companies that want to work with startups instead of the big tech companies? Because I know, especially in financial services, you know, you sort of have this trap and the trap is you build, you come out and you say, okay, we're going to do machine learning for underwriting of loans, or we're going to do machine learning of, for insurance claims, or we're going to do some sort of artificial intelligence within risk assessment on payments within fraud. And what happens isn't that you build a product that lots of companies use, but rather that whatever bank you are providing this to ends up capturing the startup. They end up, you know, because the data is on premises, the startup has to like deploy their software on premises. They can't reuse the data. It's difficult to productize. And then you're sort of like trapped in an endless commercial selling process and you've got one big customer that kind of owns you. Can you describe the go-to-market dynamics in what you talked about? Like, what are the examples where an enterprise would prefer a startup, but then would also allow the startup to breathe and to build product and not be kind of captured internally? Yeah, so you're very right that all this large corporate, they always, especially when they own the data, they always want to start up only work with them instead of working with their competitor and also be able to potentially buy this company later on with a cheaper price. So that's also a strategy for startup founder to consider at the beginning that you never want to sign an exclusive deal with a one major customer. And you could work with them, getting them as a paying contract, but no exclusivity. And always keep that in mind because large corporate, of course, they want to take advantage of the smaller startup innovation as well. They know it's harder for them to do it internally, so they're looking for third-party external help. So number one thing is a strategy in terms of negotiation. Second thing is when you design your product, also make it very clear that only working with one company not necessarily make the solution optimized the best. It's always important to get a diverse the data source in order to further optimize the solution. If the customer starts to say in the, okay, the version upgrade of the product, because you are getting more and more customers and also developing more and more use cases, they will start to also say in the value of uh, having this startup working with multiple customers. They, and of course, you have to show them both sides. If you don't negotiate at the beginning that you take an exclusive agreement, they will for, for sure like take advantage of that. I already know the key value is within data. They don't want to let go of the data. But on the other side, I already know they only have limited amount of data within their company, even though it's huge, in order to really make AI solution continue to evolve and also deliver better. 
And not only just a huge amount, but also AI need more diverse uh, data, be able to really train model in a different way to make it more capable and cover all different type of use cases. Another thing is really for founder to understand how to fine tune the model. As you said, a lot of solution this large corporate looking for is on prime. They don't want you to carry back of their carry back of their data for your training. But meanwhile, how to really fine tune the model effectively with the customer data and also carry that knowledge over to other training. That's uh, the benefit startup could potentially have when working with large corporate. We already have couple successful story with our portfolio company. We have a we have a company focused on non no code AI platform for financial and insurance industry. Their customer including millennials, uh, including large bank, also including some large insurance company. And while they keep evolving their solution and use cases, customer realize, well, while you're having bigger customer and diverse customer, I'm benefiting also by having new functionality, which we didn't think about when you initially work with us. So it's a bad, definitely a power play. It's also involved lots of the negotiation. But I think the, the education in the market is making customer become more open-minded. And meanwhile, they also realize the, the value of working with a startup is not necessary just to buy them for cheap eventually. It just to enable each other and that they benefit from the solution and also enable the startup company to grow and become a major player in the industry. I definitely agree with the point that the large models, the LLMs and the foundational models that have been built are actually quite a lot more performant than the like the narrow models that have been built on industry information. And so you do need to be able to integrate lots of things from other sources. But it, it is a difficult sales process. It's quite hard to navigate that well, but maybe maybe things are changing as well. You, you know, I totally agree with you. It's not an easy sales cycle. And uh, there are lots of uh, pre-allocation need to be done. Another thing is identify who is the right champion or cheerleader for the startup company inside a large corporate. You know, some of the startup directly go with CIO who in charge of IT, try to get a piece of IT budget. Sometimes it works, sometimes it could be very difficult because there's a cap of IT budget. So for us, we also focusing on part of our portfolio support effort is building up another community to help founder with corporate sales. We know all of our companies are doing B2B, they're doing copper sales, and the challenging part is it's not product building, they're awesome at building a really great product, but how to identify the right people to start engaging, and uh, especially people who are making financial decisions. So we built this network called the Fusion CXO Network. One of my partners, Shane, he was a former CTO at HP. So we together in 2018 built this network. Now we have over Almost 44 CTO from global one southern company. But why CTO? Because CTO typically have technical background. CTO's functionality in large corporate is really identify new technology and also champion for digital transformation, push for digital transformation internally. So their budget is dedicated to working and trying new things. The good news is we heard their budget is keep growing and getting bigger because all the large corporate want to build up their own data strategy. They want to show that not only their leader in the industry they also have lots of valuable data, they could build different type of productivity improvement too internally or even just to realize the value of the data for the company future growth. So they want to implement with new technology. So we have this net, uh, community build it up, then we'll be able to feature our founder in front of all the CTO who have budget ready, who are looking for solution, directly making the matching. So that's one thing we'll offer to the founder. So I would suggest to founder when you're working with investor, also looking for investor have strong industry connection and industry understanding, then they will be your very good partner to help you Shorten, I'll also make the corporate sales cycle much, much faster. So we have lots of company be able to, we recently have a AI in, it's also a company using AI for the financial industry. They closed the contract with one of the top Fortune 500 company. And uh, it's a huge contract size, uh, but the team is only a team of seven. So that's how we really help founder, but also we see founder explore different creative approach to get a conversation start. You're right, it's hard. It's always hard, but it could be better and it's getting better. 
you mentioned also infrastructure as a place to invest. And of course, there's lots of layers of infrastructure within artificial intelligence. I'm curious as to the industry landscape and the value chain on the AI infrastructure side, especially as you invest, like are companies being built to be acquired, you know, and there's, there's a handful of sort of large tech companies that can acquire things, or are they being built to go IPO? Like today, you know, in a world where NVIDIA is 3 trillion in market cap and where Meta is open sourcing its models in order to suffocate everybody else, what is today the capital path of an enterprise AI company that's trying to build infrastructure? Yeah, so first, the AI infrastructure is different from AI model. We're not looking at a company building models. And for AI info, yes, it's evolved chip. But on the other side, I don't think we are not looking at any company trying to directly competing with NVIDIA. I was a mature scientist at Stanford, so I know the technology within chip very well. So I'm not, I don't think in the near term, it's easy to challenge both NVIDIA and AMD on their position to dominate the silicon. But a lot of things could really work alongside with their chip, with their innovation to make, as I said, not only the compute uh, cheaper and better and faster, but also cheaper. That's an opportunity for a startup. And meanwhile, because there's a system, there's this a kind of a ecosystem of surrounding the whole AI infra, how to really solve one problem, how to solve all the problem. It's not based on only one technology. Each layer needs a solution. You initially asked whether it's a merge acquisition or IPO. I think for both, there's tons of M&A opportunity right now. We're looking at the data for the upcoming M&A. There's more and more buyer between 0.5 billion to 1.5 billion dollar range. That's very different from the past. When I sold my company back in 10 years ago, you know, a couple hundred million dollar is considered as a really good merge acquisition size because most of the buyer won't pay such a high price to acquire a company. Nowadays, different. If the merge acquisition price could go up to a billion dollar mark for early stage investor, even for startup founder, that might be a really good exit already compared with, you know, waiting for a small cap IPO, two to three billion dollar IPO, which are not performing very well in the market. And meanwhile, IPO market continue going to be opened up and also providing lots of opportunity to infa because AI infa solution is cross industry. We talk about application first. As I mentioned, we're looking at application more like vertical focused application because you don't want to use one big model for every application, which is not cost efficient. You want to have vertical specific model to solve specific use cases and uh, that vertical potentially could grow certain unicorn and become market opportunity. But if you look at AI infrastructure, one solution is not only focused on one area, it's focused across all different area. And if you could reduce the energy consumption by 100x, 200x, if you could reduce the GPU consumption dramatically, that is huge. And also they're not gonna definitely creating not only just 10, 20 billion dollar company could up to 50 billion or even higher. Another area I really, really focus on is really another two area, edge computing and also the data privacy. Now for lots of the large corporate, before they implement any AI solution, they have to implement some data privacy solution in place to make sure, you know, there's no liability concern. Lots of the industry we just mentioned, healthcare, insurance, financial, they have something in common is they're highly regulated industry in history. So now with this new AI play, they want to make sure there's no liability concern before the implementation. So Network security, data privacy is number one thing to consider. And then uh, follow that is edge computing. As I said, the future of AI is AI on the edge devices. If you talk about edge devices, oh my God, there are so many edge devices. It's not only just cell phone. Car is an edge device. Speaker is an edge device. Projector is an edge device. We have so many edge devices in our life and we want to empower all of them with a small model AI in the future. One of our company just launched a open source model two weeks ago. It's the first open source model could run on edge devices super, super fast and surpass the performance of GPT-4 and also 37x faster than Llama 2. And the, the latest one they launched, the token size is only less than a billion. 
Think about the Llama 3 launch, they still have seven, eight billion dollar token. Think about the GPT-4, there's trillion token in training. They only need less than a billion token, which is very low energy cons consume and also it's very low GPU consume. They will do some major announcement today. I forgot. I don't know whether they launched it yet, but uh, it's quite amazing. They could run it on such a small device, including like Raspberry Pi. Basically, you could run AI on any different type of uh, smaller devices. So that's the future. And think about that future. That's definitely big enough to support an IPO company. For us as an investor, we're pretty flexible. Not only me, all the partner I recruited were a former entrepreneur. We either sold our company in the past, our supporting company go IPO. So we are very flexible and also always supporting founder to make decision, you know, pro and con, which stage, whether you should take a merge acquisition offer, I'll continue to go with IPO. That's the beauty of this market. You know, we still expect it, you know, not all the company going to go IPO. For the company we invested, probably 70% of them going to exit through merge acquisition. The top 30%, they will go for billion marks and the potential aiming for IPO. But the merge acquisition could give us good return as well. Same thing for the founder. So that's a really nice dynamic to have in this financial market. There is a lot of flexibility of being able to run your capital in these different ways. When you look at AI infrastructure today in the value chain, what are the places where you see gaps? You know, so I think on the application side, it's doing the use cases better. But on the infrastructure, where do you see gaps that are not well served? I think all the four, although we're very passionate about company we invested, but we're still hoping to see more. Company coming in to solve all this uh, potential challenge with the AI infrastructure. Even before we talk about AI info, even for the model side, I think now the, the all this like a uh, large language model is done by and Sorpec, OpenAI, all this company backing by the large tech company with a uh, huge amount of capital. The competition is still within, okay, who delivered the better performance. But I wonder, we also need to start thinking about who can create a model with the lowest cost to make it really cost efficient and also energy sustainable. Maybe compromise performance a little bit, but it's more practical. For large scale AI deployment, we need to be practical of the cost of technology and also the energy consumption. So coming to the AI infrastructure, if the model is not evolving to that direction, then we need to do more on the AI infra set just to fundamentally make it cheaper and affordable and also easy to scale for people to leverage. So edge computing being there for a long time, we've been investing in edge computing since 2018. I think now there's more opportunity within edge computing right now and they want to see more innovation happen there. And I think there's lots of good innovation within data privacy already, but this is also a sector keep evolving, like Kubernetes, container security, edge security. There are always a gap. There are always opportunity for founder to potential focusing on. What does the world look like where all edge computing devices have a fully functional you know, Llama model that is able to do GPT-4, GPT-5 level performance. Like, does that mean all of our phones are going to have a local sort of private model that we train in our data? Or is it going to be the, you know, the Amazon speakers? Or is it the toaster in the fridge are going to have a robot voice? Like, what what is it going to look like in your view? Yes, uh, that could all be possible. You know, the number of fun thing, as you mentioned, that you'll be able to have a local private model and a train on top of your data. The benefit of it also partially solve the data privacy issue, right? Everything is local. It's on the edge devices. And also the response will be much faster because the latency issue won't be that big or even just a no latency or low latency. And also the AI solution could be small model and also more versatile based on different application use cases. Sometimes, you know, when we use AI, it doesn't mean it has to have a voice or a robot voice to interact with you. It's more about we want to enable the edge device not only collecting data, but also process the data locally, respond to you right away. So it could be just the showing on the screen and you could type in some information, you got the information right away. It could be just a very quick, you know, 
personalized、uh, calendar management. That's all possible.、Mm-hmm. I think that's a big opportunity in front of us. And the number one thing we need to make sure when you're running that AI on your local device, you're not、uh, just、uh, burn out your battery right away. <laughs> Going back, what I'm being keep highlighting, you know, why we need to focusing on the not only the GPU consumption but also the energy consumption. You want to make sure it's sustainable and also it could last for a certain amount of time when you're using AI on the edge devices. And meanwhile, another thing is our car. You know, the car is another potential big edge devices for us to implement AI. How do you think about the economy that will emerge? Between models and AI agents as the next step, you know. So we're kind of going from this world of supercomputers to lots of personal computers, right? In the same way we have right now these super models that that are gigantic structures. To anybody will be able to carry around an AI in their pocket, if not, you know, dozens of AIs or hundreds of AIs in their pocket. What kind of commercial activity happens when that world is there and that decentralization is possible? I really believe the coexisting of the large model and the small model. We don't need to, and also I don't think it's really cost sufficient, cost efficient to just you try to use one model solve all the problem. And there will be tons of vertical models, smaller model for a specific application, and they will work. Very well. You could fine tune this model for specific tasks and application will work much better than the large model. So it will be coexisting of the large model and small model. As you said, you potentially could carry your own model on your edge devices and go with you. It will serve you very well. So that's happening, and、uh, I truly believe that will be the future of the language model. And meanwhile, another thing is. We need to think about how to handle this private model and the open source model. We're a big supporter of the open source model, but meanwhile, regulation is coming for the AI. Oh, maybe essential. I think also regulation coming for the data. And open source model definitely is very powerful. But meanwhile, we really always need to keep the regulation in mind and how to make sure we have the genius in the bottle. But once we open it up, make sure it will continue to serve us well instead of going to the the other d- direction. And we actually are looking at some company also using AI model to detect the fake information <laughs> generated by AI. Yeah, so so there's a two way to look at it. When you look at revenue pools for AI companies, and I and I guess this is more on the application layer, and you know enterprises that are willing to pay for AI services, how do you think about the available revenue pools? Like, what's the process by which buyers of machine intelligence allocate capital to say this is how much we're going to spend, and then? What's the size of the economic opportunity for these enterprise AI companies? Like, how much do they get on average from a customer? And I know you don't you don't have access exactly to this data, but I'm sure you think about the economic revenue pools. You know, and in part, the context for my question is it's taking a bit of time for many enterprises to understand really the value proposition. So I'm curious as to like. What the market size is, and like how productized things can get versus how services oriented they are, and if you can share any examples from your portfolio, that would be great. We couldn't share the specific name of the customer, but I could give a generic kind of summarization of the momentum we saw there. And the number one thing we found is、uh, lots of the CTO of the large corporate. Their budget used to be, you know, smaller, couple hundred million dollar. Now some of them, their budget increased to billion dollar mark. When they have a billion dollar mark type of budget, which also means a majority part of it gonna allocated to the AI focused solution that they want to give contract and merge acquisition. That's kind of the rough number within the company. They're increasing awareness in order to understand how to implement the wizard. Another thing I heard from many CTO from large corporate, I mean Fortune one hundred or for,、uh, Fortune five hundred, is the CTO are getting questions from the board, not just quarterly based on the board meeting, even monthly checking in what is new in AI, what should we do in in terms of implementation, which also means awareness is strong right now, and also they could keep learning and also educate themselves, and they also worry about their competitor, how much their competitor is spending on AI. How much their competitor are evolving with the new technology integration? 
once one major customer, one benchmark corporate in certain industries start to utilize AI, things will move much faster for the rest of the company. Internally, I think lots of the founders specific position themselves coming in saying that I'm going to help you save the cost. It, it will work, but it's not working the best. We always found company came in using a solution to justify both their generating revenue and also saving the cost would easily getting a budget allocated to try out the new solution. And education is still ongoing. I know lots of large corporate are doing their internal education program, understanding how to use AI even for their employee, like employee on the front end, understand all these different AI too. So we're seeing lots of interesting data points here or there. Of course, it's not happening like all industry already open up, want to really embrace the AI and be able to quickly implement. It's not happening yet. But it's uh, evolving and lots of discussion on the board level and they're trying the solution already. And we do have many AI application company, you know, serving the traditional sector. They're signing contract up to even six, seven million dollars as a seed round startup. It's always in insurance industry. I could give you that context. The insurance industry is now known for open minded, <laughs> but they have lots of uh, data. They need productivity improvement, and uh, they can quickly see the value of the AI when they start to integrate it. And so the startup company be able to sign up up to seven, eight million dollar contract within even before they consider Series A round. So things are yeah, things are happening. Another one I mentioned to you is the AI for financial industry, right? We also have AI for logistic industry. The contract figure is al- already double digit, over ten million dollars. And the one small company, as I mentioned, the contract they're signing, the total potential upsell value is like billion dollar mark, which is crazy. We're coming up on time, but I want to leave you with one last question, which is in this space that we've been discussing in detail, what companies do you want to see get started and built that you haven't seen yet? So if you wanted you know, people to pitch you ideas, What's like the top idea that you think you'd love to see companies in, but just haven't yet? You mean within AI in general or just a specific AI info? Broadly in your AI investment thesis. Broadly in our AI investment thesis, to be honest, I think other sectors were interesting. We're seeing some company pitching to us already. It's hard to pick one sector we haven't seen any, which is also a good time. You know, lots of companies are working on different type of innovation. If you ask me which sector I want to see more, I would say I really want to see more company focus on, you know, the reduced energy consumption of the AI. It's a huge market. It's a big market. And also it's an important problem to solve before we could really implement it, implement the AI across the industry. And another thing, you know, we've been talking about ESG for a long time and people was hoping that AI would make it, you know, the sustainability better. In, in reality, it's making it worse. So I really hope to see more companies focusing on that. Absolutely. Well, Lou, thank you so much for taking the time today to share your insights with us. If our listeners want to learn more about you or about the fund, where should they go? If you want to connect with me, feel free to find me on LinkedIn and connect with me. If you want to directly email us, uh, go to our website. We'll have contact form that you could fill up to in, be in touch with us. And another thing is we also have a happy hour we host for the founder by my team. It's not for a founder to pitch. It's for answer any questions you may have. We want to really offer this back to the community, helping founder figure out some initial questions they have, working with VCL just uh, running the startup. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. That's it for this week's episode of the Fintech Blueprint. For more technical deep dives into all things fintech and decentralized finance, check out fintechblueprint.com and grab a free subscription to the newsletter. This is Lex, and I'll see you next time.